Welcome to Make Shit Happen. Our guest today is Tasir Badr. Tasir is an American entrepreneur, businessman, and philanthropist. Tasir, thank you for taking the ride and take. Thank you for taking the time and coming to see uh, to see us. And we're about to make some make shit happen right now. <laughs> thank you for having me, Sam. Really appreciate it. It's such an honor to be here. Tasir, you know I always see your building uh, ZT Wealth when I go up and down by the six ten loop. And uh, I know you are the CEO of ZT Wealth. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us a little bit about ZT Wealth and how did you get that started? Well, now we're ZT Corporate. ZT Corporate, we're okay. ZT Corporate. Yes. We've gone through a few name changes uh, through the years, but same ownership, just structure. Just as we evolved from a mom and, cop, mom and pop company in 1997, now we're 23 years, 23 plus years old. Wow. So as the companies went from ZT Global Investments to ZT Wealth, than to ZT Corporate. Right. And, uh, you know, um, ZT Corporate, very proud of our team. We've had upwards of 3,000 employees at one time. We've sold a few companies recently. We have about 1,500 employees now. We're focused in the auto, automobile industry as far as dealerships go, and healthcare is where I made my mark. Yeah, so, so you started with healthcare. Yes. And, and now you have uh, dabbled into uh, auto, uh, you know, autos and stuff like that. So you have dealerships in Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, where else? Florida and Georgia. Florida and and so soon we're coming home to Houston. Oh, so all right. Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations. Thank you. So 3,000 employees at, at one, one time, time. At one wow. time. At one time. Now we sold uh, three companies. Uh, we're down to 1,500, but uh, I could see us exceeding 3,000 here pretty soon uh, with, the, with the growth that we're trajectory. So I know you started your career with uh, Morgan Stanley mm -hmm. as a stockbroker. Mm -hmm. Okay, so tell us a little bit about it. And how did that go from that <laughs> to ZT Corporate now? Well, if I back up, I mean, I was eight years old, cutting grass, uh, you know, the neighbor's yard. I've always wanted to be my own business person. My parents are professionals. I guess you always think the grass is greener on the other side, always. And you think, well, I'll just go into business and I'll do my own thing. I always wanted to be that business person. So it kind of goes before Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was in college at Texas A&M, I had my own toner cartridge business, recycling uh -huh. toner. And uh, I did really well for a college student. I'd save pretty a good amount of money, but I wanted to do something in my degree, which was finance and entrepreneurship. So I took a job, went up to New York, uh, did a training program at Morgan Stanley, worked over a year. And I said, you know, clients were with, with us, with me, because of me, not because of the flag. Mm -hmm. And if I shifted flags, what would that do? So I partnered up with a partner uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. And Made, made it happen, made it happen. Like you say, make shit happen, right? Yeah. So we, I went for it at the age of about 22, uh, 23 at that time. And I wanted to start my own business. I went independent, so an independent brokerage house. And we cleared through at that time, I think, uh, Bear Stearns. So okay. we started that. I bis I got in the business of, of uh, managing physicians' money uh, and then started a healthcare business with those physicians. So it just kind of evolved into that. Then, so from a financial advisor, now we still have financial advising at our clients, but I only do it as an accommodation to my clients. I really don't go market out there. Uh, it's more of if they're my client or long-term partner, we do, we have financial advising division, which is significant, but it's not as significant as our, our, our other portfolio. Like I said, the operating businesses. Okay. So I know at one time you also owned restaurants. Yes. Okay. So tell us the whole spectrum of what does ZT corporate do uh, or did. So I know, I know y'all owned uh, restaurants, I know you own dealership, car mm -hmm. dealership, mm -hmm. health industry, financial uh, advice, you know, yep. advisor company. What, what, what else do y'all do? And, and what, what made you go from being a stockbroker to doing all this stuff and managing 3,000 employees? Well, I've always been entrepreneurial. Uh, and I, I like the stock market, but I just, you know, the passion um, of the market, trading, those things aren't, aren't really what, is my passion. I think the market's an interpretation of what's going on with sentiment. It's a good, it's a great training ground. You really understand people's sentiment, which is the key to running a business is people's sentiment. Uh, as far as ZT corporate, what we do, we own and operate Altus uh, Healthcare. We, I started that business from scratch as a surgery center turned hospitals. We've had radiation oncology. We've had hospices, infusion companies, pharmacies, uh, freestanding ERs. We recently did an acquisition of neighbors ER facilities. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so we are really all in in healthcare. I've scheduled patients myself as an entrepreneur, front desk person. I've, to see that company grow and do so well all over Texas. We have several hospitals all over Texas now. So that's one. And then in 2014, at the end, we diversified in the auto dealerships. And it's, it's more than just dabbling now. We're very significant. We're probably one of the largest minority-owned dealerships in the country. Um, and our brands are Chevy, Mercedes, BMW, Mazda, Toyota, and soon to be another eight more here locally in Houston that I can't go into until the deal's done. Okay, well, good. Uh, is the uh, and the deal you said the one in Houston pretty much close to getting done? It's close. I I, I see it happening in the next sixty to one hundred twenty days. I know you you also you also tried to get in multi family yes uh, apartment complexes and stuff. What about what about that? Well, we dabbled in it because I always thought. That you know, having stream cash flow would be really good. Listen, at the end of the day, it's it's a Class C type business uh, that we got into. Uh, we're in one. I feel as though to build the infrastructure out, you have to be an expert. And I, my new thing that I learned at a retreat in December was be narrow and deep, not wide and shallow. So I'm very much focused on focusing our resources on medical and auto. And personally, I don't mind personally investing my family office into different investments, and I do all the time. But to take investors' money and to do something I don't know and control 100%, I decided these two. We're doing fine in the multifamily. It will be okay. Uh, right now with the COVID situation, we're just focusing. We just stopped there at this one. So tell us what, you know, you said COVID situation. Mm -hmm. What has COVID done to your business or what has it done to... Uh, you know, I know you said taking investors' money. So, what is what it has done to investors' appetite in investing? That's tell a great, a great question. First of all, the biggest investor in the group is me. So, <laughs> I can tell you, if your skin's in the game, your clients tend to believe you. And our track record, by grace of God, has been good. I could tell you that ZT Corporate has been uh, very blessed, not blessed, very blessed during this COVID situation. We have our dealerships have done excellent. We're in the south. Uh, if I was in San Francisco or New York, I don't. I have a great operator, but if I, even if I had a great operator in those towns, I think it would be very, very tough. As the situation being in Atlanta, the Panhandle of Florida, I think we're very, you know, we got unscathed. Um, yes, we had a drop, but we did still were made profit. I think if you made profit or broke even in these the pan, the height of the pandemic and lockdown, I think you did very well. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the healthcare business goes, our ERs you can imagine did well during this time. Uh, our volume dropped, but our acuity went up. So our effective economics over the portfolio was good. The, the surgery centers, uh, hospitals where we do surgeries, we'd lost two months of surgery, couldn't do surgeries because of the elective right. surgery situation. However, if you look at the fact that, like, let's say you have to go get your haircut. I, I get my haircut every seven, eight, 10 days, you know, because it's just, I'm lucky it grows a lot. But the, that salon lost eight weeks, eight haircuts. We didn't lose that hip surgery. We didn't lose that knee. So we truly have a pent up, a pent up demand to where we had a record surgery month right. as Governor Abbott opened up the economy here right. and opened up the beds. So we've been very lucky. I think that for a business person to another business person, I'm not wishing COVID on anyone. This is unherited type situation. It's never happened. It's a force majeure situation. However, you'll find out what type of group you're invested in and what type of management team. I was at a, with the bank president the other day in Dallas, and he was like, we're one of their top clients as far as volume goes. And they were saying, we're, we really are seeing who's leaders and who are followers. And I think in this situation, you'll find that you could pick up some followers at some pretty attractive prices. Mm, so yeah. we've been doing that. Basically picking up some followers at a... At a good attractive price. At a price. big, nice price and, and, and honestly that are good resistant type businesses that just have been really hurt by this situation. So what did, how, when, when COVID happened and everything mm -hmm. closed, I know your, your corporate office probably, you know, closed for a little bit and, or you're working from home. I mean, everybody. No one worked from home. home. Oh, we no. were at the office the whole time, unless you were uncomfortable, okay. but I was the first company in the country to pay for testing and got everyone tested. Okay. All our 1500 people had voluntary testing done in March and I did it and coincide with the mayor okay. of Houston. So, so that's good. So, so, so we were all essential businesses. Yeah. We were all deemed essential financial auto health. Exactly. So you were, you were at the office and, and got it done. Yeah. And uh, so did, did you, you know, a lot of businesses and a lot of, you know, I talked to a lot of business people and they're all like, well, you know, we have a hard time, mm -hmm. you know, we lost some of our workforce. We have a hard time getting some people back. Yeah. Did you face 
that that problem also by grace of god no because i never really shut down okay you know we had a steady flow and i think uh many of the businesses that have shut down like i've been traveling to some hotels or or you know me you know, i've been traveling um safely traveling and you know a lot of people like regular uh receptionists and those at the front desk i was patron the same hotel they they can't find you know you can't find them back cuz they don't yeah. want to come back or they've gone got the job somewhere else right. so yeah so i don't have those issues step by grace of god yeah, yeah. i'm a, a lot of business people uh, you know have had that so tell us a little bit about your early life mm -hmm. okay so you grew you you're born in pakistan yes. and you moved over here with your parents at uh, one year old oh when you were one year mm -hmm. old so and and you moved to wisconsin yes so what made how did you move <laughs> make them move from wisconsin to Houston, to New York, or I mean, tell us a little bit about it. Well, my father's in the paper industry. My mom is uh, in, in; she's a biology, physics, so many different things. Uh, she's a teacher, professor. Um, my dad was in the paper industry in Pakistan at in Lahore, a company called Cohen Rayon. When Mr. I think uh, Zulfikar Bhutto, when he nationalized industry, he moved to New York to find a, a job to see if he could get you know to see if he could just explore and he actually found a job immediately uh we came about nine months to a year later in wisconsin eau claire wisconsin then we moved to upstate new york when i was a few years old after that mm -hmm. um a couple of different places in new york uh and then we moved to houston in, in 1981 and Thank he you. worked for a champion paper at that time my mom worked in the medical center for 40 years at the va hospital okay and then you went to school back to new york and no texas a &M. Okay, you went. I'm to the Texas last of four Aggies in the family. I'm the youngest of four kids. Okay, so you 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 went to A and M. So you were an Aggie, and then mm. you went to New York for mm. with Morgan Stanley. Mm -hmm. Got yes, you. exactly. And then, so let's let's fast forward. Yeah, you were at Morgan Stanley. You you and a friend, a partner of yours, decided you were going to open up your own company. You went yes. on your own, and uh, let's just let's just go back memory lane over there. And yeah, what happened after that? Well, we opened up. Uh, I moved, they were, Morgan Stanley was actually opening up an office in Houston. It was called Morgan Stanley Dean Winter at the time. And they were just, they were evolving a new office in West Houston. And they asked me, do I want to, you know, be involved in that office? And I said, you know, I love New York as a young person, but it's really hard place to live. You have no money. Uh, so I moved back to Houston, lived with my parents. I worked here a few months, uh, completing a year here. I met a partner who had come from a business family, had a lot of business contacts, and we got, I said, let's go independent. He liked the idea, so we went independent and started this company in April of 1997. And it was, at that time, the market was really hot. The NASDAQ was on fire. Uh, you know, people think the NASDAQ being at 10,000 today. The NASDAQ was at 5,000 and 2,000 before the tech bubble. Yeah. And, uh, and then it went down all the way down, lost almost 70, 80% of its value, and then came back. Uh, to what it is today. Uh, so, you know, we were in that business. Uh, but I really realized, Sam, that I'm an entrepreneur. I've always, I threw the paper as a kid, collected money from the Houston Chronicle. It was like how much you percent you collect, you you, you keep it. Um, I did the, I was making $700 a week at the age of 13, cutting grass <laughs> during the summer. I've always wanted to be a business. It's just, it's just in my DNA. It's who I am. To see people who don't know who you mm -hmm. are, okay, and and they don't see the magnitude of the business you run. Right. Tell us a little bit, if you don't mind. Brag a little bit for us. Oh, <laughs> come from a humble beginning. Um, you know, I could tell you, Sam, that uh, it's really it's. I, you know, you said this this podcast is very uh, well titled. I mean, you just got to make it happen, right? So I uh, if I look back on it, it's pretty humbling to tell you. From one employee, we've had like I said over three thousand at one time. We've done over 700 million in revenues, had 70, 80 million in, in earnings. Uh, we've had $280 million in recent exits uh, in the last three years. Uh, every day is not a Sunday, but uh, when you got to squeeze lemon out of lemonade and some of those stories, uh, you make lemonade out of lemons and, and some of those lemons end up being some of your best track records you ever have. So, you know, we've had a great company, great people, I have some great partners. It's not about me. I have a great team of people. Uh, and, you know, there's an I and win. Sometimes in the clutch, you got to shoot the shot. Yeah. Uh, and I believe that that's what Michael Jordan used to say. Um, but, uh, you know, you got there's no I in team. Yeah. 
again. So you say every day is not a Sunday, right? Mm -hmm. So that means that, you know, when you say that every day is not a Sunday, of right. course, there's disappointments. Sure. And, and some days are rainy days like today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> tell us tell us your rainy, stormy day or, or you know, something that, that you... God, I've had many rainy days, you know. Um, the market dropped when I was, when I first started ZT. We were on fire. You did so well. I was a toast kid of the town, you know, at, at these... Uh, uh, events at we were making a lot of money but i realized the market didn't i didn't make the money the market made the money you know because the market was hot mm -hmm. the market crashed and then you're like what do i do you know what happens and you just got to hold hold people's hand not run away so that was one but i think it, i think I'll, I'll tell you a story that was a great story for me that i think went is really relevant if i'm thinking about uh, memory lane in 2008 we were building in in conjunction with the city of Pearland. before Pearland blew up we were the the first class A office building in Pearland. And the reason we sh the market was, it was everything was moving towards that development wise. And I be took my first real estate development project, 80,000 square foot building. Literally the city of Pearland was pumping in a 1.2 million out of a $16 million deal, which is really nothing, but it was their a ratification of the deal. And as soon as I broke ground, I mean, we had the city manager there, the city mayor there, it was some state officials there. It was a big deal because what Pearland is today, they'll even tell you because ZT helped develop Pearland. And now you see buildings everywhere. In fact, we have, still have a back office there right now. We put the uh, shovel in the ground. Lehman Brothers announced literally that day that the crisis happened, mm -hmm. financial crisis, and they were melting down and Bear Stearns. And da -da -da. We had already bought the steel. The steel prices were... 30% higher, 30% lower the next day. Wow. It was tough. So our office is in the gallery area. At that time, I was in an executive suite, you know, small where, you know, uh, maybe a floor of the executive suite. I literally said, you know, everyone was throwing the key at the bank. I wasn't going to do that. Our investors were doing really well. I mean, I actually did extremely well during the recession because I was in the right place. Oil was well and healthcare was doing well in Houston. And I said, I can't let this tarnish my track record. I was too young at the time. And still, even now, I don't want anything to tarnish my track record. I try my best not to do that. So what we did was I moved our corporate office literally overnight to Pearland, which is way out of the way mm -hmm. <laughs> for a financial firm that's headquartered in the gallery area. Exactly. So it's like, so we did that. Uh, we established the price, played our triple net, whatever, and then attracted others. And while everyone else was throwing away the key. You know, and we saved the investment. I can tell you most commercial buildings went out of bankrupt at that time or foreclosed or negotiated a buyout or something. We didn't. And now it's one of our better assets. And we still held, hold on it today. We did, got a non-recourse loan eventually. And, you know, we're going to sell it soon when the prepayment goes away. So the thing is, where there's a will, there's a way. You know, you just say, make shit happen. You got to make it happen. I mean, we could have told, you know, we could have told investors, hey, hey, this is force majeure. It's not our fault. Yeah, I you mean, know, and but you can't do that, especially at that age. When yeah, you're, but at that time you're only 34 years old. Yeah, exactly. I had no, cho but see, in my opinion, you had no choice. Yeah, we have to make it happen. You know, I don't. But you know, one thing like when you watch CNBC and they go, "Oh wow, the 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 earnings of Apple, which is you know a great company, for example, let's say the earnings miss their earnings by, or their iPhones don't make enough iPhones in China because of COVID, or they miss their earnings by one cent, the shares drop 30 bucks or 20 bucks or whatever." You know, we don't believe that at ZT. We got to figure it out. That's just the way we are. We're wired. Now, again, we're much more corporate than we used to be. We do, a, we have a lot more due diligence than we ever did. Before, as an entrepreneur, as a kid, you do things by the seat of the pants. I don't know if I would do some of the things I've done 20 years ago that ended up, I think I was just lucky and got my mom's prayers worked out and they did well. We don't do those things now. We're extremely, our probably investment committee is more tough than any bank committee. Mm -hmm. So I'm very proud of the fact how we've evolved. Uh, but, you know, lucky, risk, mom's prayers. Uh, and uh, I think when you're trying to do the right thing, karma, it works out like in that, in that example. So let me, tell me, uh, I know you've been, you've been in business now for 23 years. But mm -hmm. First of all, congratulations, because that's a milestone, right? right. So you started when you're 23 years old. What, what is next for ZT? I think ZT, you know, we're going to grow. We, what we look at companies now is, first of all, we do a lot of philanthropy too. That's really important right. to me. Um, what I'm sure we'll get into um, establishing that part of our side of our, for the community, but more known than we're known now for it. Uh, ZT wants to keep building its auto platform. 
We feel like there's a great opportunity there. We feel like in our healthcare side, there's great opportunity. Uh, we do not want to, I've learned through these three exits I've had, mm -hmm. we don't like holding on to assets now without having some sort of major liquidity event. In our culture, Sam, you know where we come from, you don't sell a business that's printing money. Exactly. But in this country, you don't know. You just don't know the cycles of business and what can happen. So it's, you know, in my, in my thinking, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Mm -hmm. So the way I look at it is, the way we look at a business now is, we wanna just keep growing our business. I think the Altus Healthcare Neighbor System, I'm not selling this to, I'm foreshadowing or anything, I don't have a buyer for it. But we wanna keep doing what we're doing we feel like we can become a strategic one of the a, if you see the way i look at a business now is we don't start things from scratch anymore we hardly do so when we look at a business we have to acquire professionalize scale and have an exit mm. so those four things are very vital for me so in the healthcare side we feel like we're scaling it we probably are going to different cities in texas we're looking at actually we're closing a couple of deals in dallas now we're looking at a deal in florida so when a private equity company or strategic healthcare buyer comes in, they'll say, wow, they've replicated it. We want like our infusion company. We built it to six states. The group that bought us a multi-billion dollar private equity, they're in 35 states now. And they we took money off the table. So what we want to do is build our healthcare portfolio over the next, I think, three to five years, exit that to a group, and then really, and then the auto side, I just love that business. Um, I don't, I, we'll probably do a dividend recap, get some money out for our investors. Um, but I like that business. I like the models. So I don't know yet, but we don't, we look at businesses in those four steps, like I said. And then once we sell the auto, the healthcare side, which in my opinion could be, you know, a huge exit for us. Uh, we feel as though that will become more of a fund. Like you'll see in New York where we mm -hmm. have, we hire operators or former operators like myself, mm -hmm. like my partner, Craig Kilo, some other experts, and really now start investing in other healthcare deals and look at people to back and management teams. Because I'm getting too old now to do this every day, to run companies. I'd rather manage companies from as an oversight point of view, as a true private equity partner. Mm. So that's next for ZT. So basically you, you're saying that auto, I mean, do you have a goal of like becoming like a, like a, uh, almost like a group one or auto nation kind of thing? It's That's funny you saying. mentioned group one. My president uh, helped uh, start group one okay. and uh, we have that platform. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have that, I have that, I have that. Plan. That vision? Yeah, okay. that vision is exactly, and I like what group one's done. I, I, for disclosure, I invest in their company. I love what they do. Uh, they've done a great job. And being a, there's very few minority auto dealers in the country, and there's a big problem with that. And But the manufacturers want to find a qualified minority. It's so hard to become a dealer uh, because the rigor, rigorous process, rigorous process of getting approved, even Warren Buffett had trouble getting approved. So the fact that we're approved and we've done a great job and the manufacturers are happy with us, mm -hmm. we get opportunities. And uh, there's not many minorities out there, so we are like becoming quickly the poster child for the minority auto dealer. So tell us when you want to go out, do a, a, you know, do like like right now you're trying to buy eight dealerships or mm -hmm. whatever, or whenever you're trying to buy buy a hospital or buy like neighborhood like mm -hmm. like the emergency rooms. Either. What do you do? How? What is your process? If you don't mind, uh, I mean, if it's not proprietary, just no. share with us a little bit. No, I mean, it's basic uh, due diligence 101. I mean, what we look at is, first of all, does it fit our, I don't look at transactions anymore. Yeah. I'm not looking to do a transaction to get a fee. The fees that we charge in our deal are basically to pay for our due diligence. Right. We're not making money in our, and that's not where we make our money. And that's where our investors make their money. We make the money by running the business. So how we look at things is, does it fit our strategy? So like say the hospital in Dallas or the eight dealerships in Houston, we're trying to grow our earnings. Does it, are they mismanaged? Does there an opportunity to create value? Can we scale it? Does it, uh, does it appeal to our scalability? Gotcha. Does it appeal to, to there's several boxes it's got to check. Can we create value basically philosophically, monetarily and have a liquidity strategy? And if it fits those, we'll look at it. If it doesn't, We'll pass. So, so we Mike, probably looked at 50, 60 deals of auto in the last six months and bought one deal. So then you go, you go, you find a deal. You're like, hey, this is a perfect deal. This is a good deal. So why do you go to private investors instead of going to a bank? We go to banks. Okay. Well, bank finances, I mean, the debt piece, we use leverage, we use leverage and investors. Both. Okay. So tell, tell me, for people who are listening and they don't know, mm -hmm. they're like, well, you know, how do people raise money with investors and why do they raise money with investors? You know, you being the expert, would you mind sharing? Well, I mean, 
even uh, even the biggest companies raise money with investors. Exactly. And the lar- even Warren Buffett raised money with investors, Berkshire Hathaway. So it's it's how they can acquire and scale. No one can do it all on their own. That's why it's investors part of the team. The bank's part of the team. We're all partners. And the way we look at it is if we're providing some expertise they can't get somewhere else, that's why they invest with us. Mm-hmm. And we're giving them a return that satisfies their risk appetite. So, so let's say a lot of people like, you know, sometimes people look at it like, you know, hey, I want to grow my business, but I don't want to go get outside investor and pay them a 10 percent. Yeah. Return. What do you say on on people who or what kind of advice do you give? Well, if you look at Tillman Fertitta, I think he's a great example in the Landry's. He owns mm-hmm. the Post Oak Hotel and he has, you know, so Golden many restaurants, nuggets, so Golden much nuggets, so many things. And uh, he said on CNBC the other day, I'll take a quote from him or paraphrasing. He's like, you know, everybody's like, oh, Tillman, you're over leveraged. Everybody com- accuses you of this, accuses you of that. He goes, I don't want partners. I don't want to answer to them. I don't need them. I like to make my decisions. I like to go to, I'm that guy. So I took a bunch of debt from the market. So I took banks. I took mezzanine debt. I did whatever. But you know what? I don't want partners. And that's his personality. I respect him. He has 100% of the pie. Uh, if you have that personality, you want to work with investors, because work with investors is relationships. In every relationship, you got to work at it. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's husband, wife, friend, sister, brother, mother, daughter, mother-in-law, <laughs> you always have to work at it, right? So some people have that personality. We personally, I'm a friend. I think I'm a friendly person. I think our and you take the, the firm takes the tone of the leader. I think that we've got done 23 years of investors. My when I was able to earn more in the first few after the first four or five years, I probably became between debt and equity the most the highest investor in mm-hmm. my deal. So I'm on the same side of the table as my investor too. Gotcha. So, so you, so some people like what you, what you're saying is some people, they don't want partners. So they don't have the temperament for it. Yeah. I mean, they don't want to report. They, they don't, don't want to, report. they don't want to have reporting. Um, I think they want, everybody wants to be transparent. But they don't know how to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things. I'm not saying Tillman's not transparent. He's transparent. He is. Well, he just don't want to answer to anybody. Don't answer to anybody. Don't want, he wants to be the decision maker. Mr. And I am the decision maker too. I'm the sole yeah. general partner that no one can really tell me. But at the end of the day, I've never exercised that right. Yeah. In a practical matter, if you really want to grow your business and have investors, yes, you do have the sole decision at the end of the day. In my structure, we do in our structure. However, I've always have committees. I always have people, some outsiders, some insiders. So when we do make a decision, yes, it'll go on me, but I've involved some experts who from outside. I mean, I probably spend millions of dollars a year on soft costs, attorneys, and not for litigation, just to get the advice, attorneys, CPAs, I mean, third party auditors. Since you brought long. that since you brought that up, why you know, a lot of time people say, you know, have a good attorney, have a good accountant. Yeah. Tell us a little bit your perspective. Why is it so important to have some of those? First of all, I think that you don't know the law. And by the way, ignorance is not, unfortunately, ignorance is not a defense. You know, and by the way, a lot of people are truly ignorant of something happening or they're, uh, you know, they're not informed. But the law or the, or the spirit of the law doesn't really defend you for that. So having a good attorney, making sure you're going in all in, understanding all the things that can go wrong. See, contracts are not there um, to, they're there for a rainy day. No one really refers to the contract unless there's a some sort of dispute coming. Mm-hmm. So you got to look at, have someone draw all those scenarios for you that you yourself who's in the weeds are not going to see. Mm-hmm. You're not going to see those issues because you want that product pushed out no matter what. Because you're the entrepreneur. The lawyer or the accountant is going to make sure it's tax efficient, do all those things that you're not thinking about. You just want to, you want to somehow get that product out because you're the entrepreneur. You're biased. Mm -hmm. You need an unbiased opinion who can protect you and your firm and the investor too. So, and that's, that's why it's important to have a good, good lawyer. What about a good accountant? Very important. I mean, tax efficiency, there's Every day, I mean, look at the Trump's laws on a tax. I mean, I still can't understand it. I, mean, I just call, you know, look at the PPP and all these things. Like, and, and, and there's so many things, this COVID thing, the stimulus package. I tell people, call me, what should I do today? I, I said, first of all, you need to spend, relative to your business, a percentage of that to invest in a damn good lawyer who can understand. Because a lot of people who dot the I wrong or T wrong on an SBA application, they can go to jail yeah. without even knowing it. So you got to have those things. Have a good lawyer, good accountant. Yes. In business, that's very yes. important. Soft costs, very important. very important. Especially in the minority cultures like ours, Sam, 
They don't believe in soft costs. They want to see something for their money. Yeah. The intangible is their business. Yeah. They don't. They don't really understand that. They need to spend money on that. Need to spend money on that. So you used to be in a restaurant. You used to have a restaurant in your portfolio also. Not no more. Or or yeah. still have some. I I'm pretty much out. Okay. Why? Well, Popeyes. I had Popeyes. We did well in that. I think we bought it three multiple three or four. I, I don't remember. Don't quote me. And we sold it eight. Uh, it was a, like a ten year hold. Uh, we bought a ma- management team that was at Popeyes that was just changing. So we got an opportunity, got an opportunity to exit. We exited. We rolled into Carl's Jr. Hardee's. We got into that business in you know, and it was it's really good West Coast brand and East Southeast brand, but in Texas didn't do that well. So I just kind of like basically with the situation of COVID wrapped it up and kind of disposed of it. Again, I feel like my time is just really well used in hospital. nice ass hospital, uh, healthcare and auto. I just know it. Was, just know that this was, was the restaurant, the Hardee's and Carl Jr. was a rainy day. So Definitely re- a rainy day. <laughs> Definitely a rainy day. But you know, we made lemon out of lemonade in some deals. But again, I'm, I'm going to figure out a way for my clients how we can figure it out. But yeah. it's definitely not one of my best ones for sure. So, and again, I'll attribute that to not knowing narrow and deep because I never did it myself. In auto, I had the right expert, skin in the game. I understood. I learned it. I sat with them. I'm learning, you know, in the, in the, we did really well in the Popeye's deal. And you just think again, oh my God, I can do it again. The best thing is just, again, when you don't, you may have got lucky. So rainy days happen. To say you, you're very passionate about this auto industry. Look like you really like it. Love it. And enjoy. So, you know, with, with the with the way everything is going mm-hmm. online and, mm-hmm. and and car you know car business has been changing yeah you got to evolve so so but but why are why your interest in the car business when car business is not like it used to be 10 years ago no it's not the, not your dad's car business I, mean, yeah. i also don't drive my dad's Oldsmobile either <laughs> so you know uh but yeah we have an online presence huge online presence yeah. you know so it and in the the manufacturers uh you know, look at the Uber situation right now. Right. I'm not saying Uber is going away. I think Uber will come back after the vaccine and treatments and whatever. But I think a lot of people still say, I want to drive my own car. You know, and by the way, Uber drivers buy from us too. So we're good. Either yeah. way, we're good. Uber and Lyft. Yeah. So we have all, we, you know, we have an online presence. Uh, the millennials don't want to spend time uh, at the dealership like all day. Like my dad used to be an outing. He used to go four or five dealerships and come home with a car yeah. and make a deal. Uh, over here, they've, they've kind of made the deal online and then they come in just to pick up the car and get the service. So right. I feel there's more people buying than ever cars, especially millennials. Um, and I feel like there's just so much opportunity here. There's so, we don't have the inventory right now to service our, uh, our, with the COVID situation yeah, so, so, and all that. So that's my other question. You yeah. know, a, a lot of car dealerships don't have the inventory, yeah. you know, because the manufacturers were closed. Yeah. Okay. So what, what are y'all doing in that situation? Well, uh, used car business prices are going up and our yeah. gross is going higher. So it's great for our investors. And also we can, we, we've been able to take care of our, you know, customers with the used car, but we do, we're probably one of the larger dealerships in Atlanta and we have a large platform in Florida and we do so well that we, we had so much stockpile from the manufacturers. The better you do, you more inventory you get. The dealerships are called ZT Motors or? ZT Motors. Oh. Well, actually ZT Motors is the holding company. It's called Steve Raymond Chevrolet, which is oh. an iconic dealership in Atlanta. Been around for a long, long time near uh, the Brave Stadium in Atlanta. And ZT Motors, uh, Toyota Fort Walton Beach in Florida, BMW Fort Walton Beach, Mazda Fort Walton G- Beach, and now ZT Motors Mercedes has asked us, we're, which is great. We've converted our name from ZT Motors Mercedes to Mercedes Benz of Fort Walton Beach. Okay, so you have a Mercedes dealership over there too. Yes. Okay. Uh, I see you have one outside. You didn't buy it from me. Uh, matter of fact, I did call Mercedes uh, at uh, Walton. Uh, you oh, did? Walton Beach, yes. You did? You, they, got a, you, uh, got a, you got a deal? I saw it said Florida. I said maybe you yeah. bought it from us. Uh, well, I didn't know because... Uh, well, I did That's a nice to, ride. That I, I spoke to a nice. couple of people. That's really nice. Yeah, I spoke to a couple of people over there at your dealership. Uh, it just ended up that that other place ended up being a better deal. Okay, all yeah. right. Well, you know, you know how they say you know, not, and and what you touch right now, and I wanted to say that nowadays people. I was going to charge you now for this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to give you a rebate on the car. <laughs> you didn't know. I didn't know. I should have called. See, you, you got to think soft costs, intangibles. <laughs> it's relationship. Yeah, I should have called you and said, you know what? Can we get that done? No, honestly, I was going to. No, it's looking a beautiful at, car. Congratulations. Looking, thank you. I was looking at another car and then that one was ended up being edition one. 
and there's not a lot of edition ones in the country. Beautiful car. I have this car at home. Thank Zach you. Zach ZT is a beautiful car. You love it? Love it. Well, that's good. I'm, that, that means I made a, I made a good purchase. A made great a good purchase. Decision. Great purchase. Very underrated car. Uh, so I know you are in philanthropy. Yeah. And I know you hold a gala every year. Yes. At, at, in December. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it started with a client kind of appreciation party um, in 2003, uh, 2002, and uh, evolved then to, uh, we always gave back to the community. Mm -hmm. And then we decided to sponsor a, you know, different uh, American Heart Association or American Cancer Society. Robert Ory's, um, his daughter had passed away. She had some disease and we sponsored him. Mm -hmm. Then we decided, you know what? My sister, uh, who's Dr. Tamina Badar said, we have so many doctors in our network. Why can't we use our facilities that we're already paying for? Like you're paying for the overhead here, right? Tonight, it's already paid for. Um, why can't we use that to give back to some indigent care, some people? And so we decided to get our vendors involved mm -hmm. uh, and they sponsor the event. So any proceed from the event, there's cost to the event, obviously. Of course. And then after that, the proceeds go to our foundation. And the proceeds go so far because the MRI machine we have, the doctors giving their time, their, um, the, the nurses, they're already paid for. Yeah. So let's say a radiation oncology patient, a prostate bill charges are 200 grand, let's say, it'll cost us 20 grand to do that. So that's $200,000 worth of work that we did for that patient that can't afford it. So the, the gala is about 15, it's the largest gala in Houston every year. I mean, I don't know what we're gonna do this year. It's, it's definitely still on at this time, uh, but 1,600 people, 13 to 1,600 people, we have a great performer usually. I usually give some sort of rundown about the year, what we did, what we're gonna do. And we have a, a great time. Right. Uh, it's just, it's all about having fun, community, giving back. Usually our leadership of the community is there and we're just really proud. Uh, I honestly now just show up as a guest. I used to at least create the gala, but my team does everything now. And I'm just like a guest as you would be. Yeah, yeah. so I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's a very big, nice, uh, deal. I know I, I went to one of them a couple of years ago and, and, and it was, it was a good time. Thank you. So, so tell me, what do you, so, so all the, uh, it, does it, all the money go to a particular organization or is it, does it go in your hospital? I mean, and, and people, right. That's a great question. Altus foundation is the uh -huh. name of our foundation, which right. is named after our healthcare group. Right. And, uh, our president, Marcus, he, we work with our committee where to give money to like last week, you know, these Cops have been so beaten up, poor guys, um, in all this situation. And I know it's a very tough situation for everybody. Um, and so we gave, we fed all the, the Houston Police Union. At the same time, we also gave back a lot to the African-American community and their churches and things of that nature. So we do things like that that are off the cuff, that are not necessarily, uh, you could say, uh, healthcare related. Mm -hmm. But we'll do this, you know, we'll do the surgeries, uh, We'll do the radiation oncology. We'll do dental work. We do all the things that we do in our facilities anyways. And that's where we mark majority of the money. And, and uh, uh, so wh uh, what is the main goal of the philanthropy? I mean, why did it start and why do you continue doing it? Well, I think that there's a need in healthcare right. and we're in the healthcare business. Again, narrow and deep. We know that business right. uh, and we know there's so many, so expensive for the common person without insurance, even if they have insurance, lots, like this COVID situation, it's gonna create that they can't pay rent, they're not gonna be able to have a job, they won't be able to you know, pay the deductible. Some people have insurance, so they can't even pay their deductible. Right. So it just depends. So that's why the goal of the foundation is to make it actually outside of the, the gala, that actually we get some more corporate sponsors. We have vendor, are mostly our vendors, and ZT is the biggest corp sponsor. ZT itself is the biggest sponsor every year. Uh, about a couple of months ago, I think bef uh, I think earlier this year, we interviewed Swapna Legarwal, and yeah. I saw that you are you have partnered up with him. Yes, tell us a little bit about that partnership or collaboration or whatever. It's it is. more of a collaboration. I respect him a lot. He's a young young entrepreneur, done extremely well for himself in a very short period of time. Uh, he's from the Indian community. Um, very, we're both proud South Asians. Uh, I feel as though he's narrow and deep in the multifamily business. Um, and I'm narrow and deep auto and health side. So if there is a collaboration, we could raise capital together and help each other in businesses that we are running. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great. 
we actually just started in talks to do something and then COVID hit literally three days after we announced. Wow. So we, we've kind of like let everything be on. It's not, it's on, it's on ice for now. It's on ice right now. But that doesn't mean it won't pick up. Okay. And, and I mean, yeah, uh, Swapnil is a, is a great guy. I mean, you know, his, his story is, is very, you know, inspiring it at is. the same time, you know, um, and I think uh, he had a, a article in, uh, I mean, in Forbes, mm -hmm. I think 300 to, I think it was 2 billion. Something yeah. Like and that. in real estate. Yeah. yeah. In real estate. So, I mean, he's, you know, also uh, just like, just like yours, because I mean, you know, you started with this, uh, you know, just just working for somebody, and yeah. all of a sudden you're like, "Well, I want to be an entrepreneur, right?" Forever, and I mean, you know, seven hundred million dollars revenue is not a joke in a, in a year. So, I mean, you know, I I tip my hat to you. Thank you. So, long term goal, you know, let's say you're you know you're forty six today. Mm -hmm. Where do you want? Hope to I be? don't look that old, but I'm getting there. <laughs> where do you, you want to be? Uh, you know, when you are fifty five, sixty. I think I'd 56. like, you know, as far as ZT goes, I want to be a great father, you know, uh, give more of my time to my son. I think it's very important now. I think I'm able to, I have a great team right now that I wasn't able to five years ago. So, but as far as the quite answer is, I think in the next three years, I think I could be more chairman of the board or, you know, um, instead of the CEO and chair, chairman and CEO of ZT corporate and really, um, I, I've been asked so many times to work with, you know, with the, my Texas A&M University. I do lectures there. I'd love to give back to the, you know, youth. Uh, I'd like to be involved in our fund from, an ex, you know, like an executive chairman or, you know, a, ch a chairman of the board instead of day to day. And I'm not saying retiring. I'm actually working sm with my skill level, using my brain and promoting from within other folks to become, to take my job day to day. Gotcha. So what does the average day look like in this year, but his life? Uh, a lot of phone calls, Okay. uh, a workout every day, uh, time with my son, um, somehow, some way he plays a lot of baseball. I'm involved in 55 baseball teams that we own as well, uh, to, from Houston, Texas and California youth baseball teams, mm -hmm. uh, trying to give back to the community that way. So I go see a lot of baseball practices. Uh, it, I come home, you could say I go to work probably around I'm not a very early morning person because I'm a late night person. I probably go to work at, you know, I'm on the phone early, but I could probably at work mid morning, early afternoon, um, go home 6.30, 8.30, have a dinner at nine to 11 with someone somewhere. Uh, someone's flying pre COVID probably, yeah. uh, 11.30, uh, probably check emails one, two in the morning. Uh, I talk to my partner in Dubai, this, that, and go to sleep and it starts again. So you know, I've, I've, uh, I know I know several people that work, uh, you know, at ZT or mm -hmm. have worked at ZT yeah. at one time. Matter of fact, my controller used to work at your place also, and uh, you know, we we have all heard of these famous Tuesday night meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about that. It's a pajama party. Um, <laughs> the Tuesday night, you know, it's like in the restaurant industry. It's like usually not that busy, right? Yeah. So I, that's where you used to download. I kind of used to call people out. What's happening? What's going on? Catch them on their toes. Uh, and, and also really it was a brainstorming session and we did it. I think that's what built this company. I really do. Uh, from 2000, I would say five, we started it to a good, what, 2000, I'd say 16, 17, 17, but we have not had Tuesday night meeting since July of 2017. Oh, really? No. So what was the 2000, uh, what, what was the Tuesday night meeting? It was marketing. What time did it start? It started when I showed up. Unfortunately, it was, uh, I wasn't always on time because I had come from a dinner meeting and so, it come late. So 11, 10, 30, 11. 10, 30, 11, and it ended at like 2, 2, 30. <laughs> and, then, and if we were really lucky, if we really got like, just like my, my coach says, my uh, son's baseball coach says, listen, if we catch the fly balls properly, we can get out of here in 15 minutes. Yeah. It just depends who had their stuff together. If they had their stuff together. And then sometimes our means last an hour. Uh -huh. But then we had the gala time. Literally, we could go, we could literally be there till 7, 8 in the morning. Wow. It was because that's when we were, we didn't have the ability and the funds to have an event coordinator and all that. We were doing everything ourselves. All right, good. But listen, Tuesday night meetings are over. Tuesday night meetings are they over. Why, why, a, they, why, why are they over? They don't even have a Saturday Saturday meeting anymore. Why? I got a great team with okay. the skill set. I don't I don't have to, you know, um, I, they know what they're doing. They run a great team. I have presidents of divisions now. We have so many presidents in the company. And uh, sorry, there's a few presidents. There's several controllers. Like probably in your controller workforce, probably that controller did everything for all ZT companies. Now we have a controller for the a controller and a CFO for 
for the healthcare side, for the auto side, subdivisions of those. So it's just a lot different. A lot it's from different. a mom and pop evolution to a corporate private equity backed company. So let's say it's uh you know from thou you know thousands of years of years from today, you know, because since you're in health industry and you love the health health industry, you build this something that kept you alive for a thousand years and but now it's time to go, right? And go where? Go to the next to the to next the, life. To the next life, right? And uh you you know, you you want to leave something for the rest of the world. Yeah. You know, three three advices, something, you know, something how to live you know, how to carry yourself, yeah. something, uh, you know, whatever, you know, what to see better will know, be known for three things. What will it be? I think, um, I mean, there's so many things I could say. Um, just give me a moment. But uh, I think, I think a lot of people miss out on life. A lot of people regret time. I, one advice is, you know, time passes very quickly. You, in a, I think, you know, in this, in this show's name, I would say, you got to make it happen, not watch it happen. And that's huge. You got to make it happen. And no one's going to do it for you. Another comment, no one will do for you what you do for yourself, ever. Mm -hmm. Not possible. And I think, you know what, and I think I missed out on this a lot, but I'm still relatively young. And that's, I think the workouts have helped and the, and the good diet has helped. I can still enjoy it. Enjoy life. You know, enjoy life. Don't think about it. All right, well, that's, gotta do it. that's good. So don't think about it. I want to ask you two or three questions. Yeah. And uh, I mean, and so before we end this uh, yeah. uh, interview, and I always ask people, define define your meaning of humility. I think when someone sees me and says, wow, I didn't know that that's that guy that owns that house or that business or that he hangs out with so-and-so people, just he's a regular guy. I think that to me is when I won the humility argument, you know, and I've, I've, I feel as though that because it's really important for me to not people to feel like when, when you can hang out with a janitor or a CEO and you treat them the same, that to me is when you, that's a, how I test somebody. So I would want someone to test me that way. So I feel like that's a definition of humility. What is your definition of success? Happiness. Happiness. It's not wealth. It's not money. It's happiness. And money does. So here, I always ask people mm -hmm. this, mm -hmm. you know, not in the, not on interview or, you know, not, well, since you said that, I'm mm -hmm. going to ask you. Yeah. A lot of people say money doesn't buy happiness. It helps. It helps. It helps. But it doesn't buy it. Doesn't buy it. Doesn't buy it. You know, that's why I said you got to spend time with your loved yeah. ones and give back and spend time with yourself. But you it know? definitely helps and makes it easy. For sure. Yeah. For sure. Uh, I know... Before we end this thing, I know you are really good friends with A-Rod. Yeah. So how I was many on times the phone with him today. How many times <laughs> have you met Jennifer Lopez? Oh, many times. Take a picture for me next time. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for coming over here, coming on the show. Thank you. You know, people, you know, people can always give you money. People can always get, you know, buy you gifts. But time is such a gift. It is. That that is valuable. And once time goes by, it never comes back. So never I man. really appreciate it Thank that you, you gave me your time. And you shared your time with all our listeners and with the world. Thank you. I'm uh, so honored what you're doing for the community. Um, when I'm sorry we didn't hook up earlier. No problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, you know, the problem is sometimes, and I'll leave you with this. You know, now the good thing about our company, now we're not a mom and pop company anymore. But of course, then you have a PR group. Okay, who should we go on? Who should we do? I just want to be myself and come out and hang out. You know, and sometimes it kind of pulls you back. Uh, I know structure is important. Mm -hmm. Um and I, I'm not knocking my PR team. They do a great job. <laughs> but to say time, you know, sometimes it's cool to be real. And I appreciate you being real with me. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so right. grateful. Thank Perfect. you. Perfect.